Hello, my name is Jordi Izzard. I'm Senior Associate Director of SICE Alumni Relations. And today's date is February 2nd, 2016. And I have the pleasure of being here today for an oral history interview with Clifton R. Wharton Jr., who graduated from SICE in 1948. So thanks so much for taking the time to be with us today. I'm very much looking forward to a conversation. It's a pleasure. Um, why don't we go ahead and start with what originally brought you to SICE? Well, uh, when I was about to graduate from Harvard, uh, undergraduate, uh, I, of course, was interested in going into the Foreign Service. The reason is that my father, who was the first Negro to pass the Foreign Service exam, uh, was a diplomat. In fact, he became a career diplomat for many, 40 years. And I admired my father greatly. And having lived abroad with him at his various posts, uh, and I knew exactly what an, a diplomat did. But I wanted to follow my father's footsteps. So uh, the question was where to go to study. Uh, I had just gotten my bachelor's degree in history, honors from Harvard. And I decided that, along with his advice, that it would be very good for me to uh, go to a, an additional bit of education to prepare myself for the Foreign Service exams. And so I applied to two places. I applied to Fletcher at Tufts University and a brand new school in Washington, D.C. called the School of Advanced International Studies, which at that time was not part of the Johns Hopkins University. And interestingly, uh, I had the tail end of my GI Bill, and I also had a scholarship from the Foreign Service Association, which of course is what my father belonged to. And when I applied to Fletcher's, they did not accept me. But when I applied to SICE, they did. Uh, I learned several years later that my application created a firestorm here at SICE, because it turned out I was the first black to ever attend. Sites. And there was a great deal of commotion about the fact that Washington was segregated in those days, and the school was at 906 Florida Avenue, Northwest, where we lived in the building where we had classes, the library, the dining room, everything. And the women lived in a dorm separate to us next door, which meant that I was enrolled and in a segregated city, living in a non-segregated situation. Uh, but one of the reasons why uh, they admitted me was there was a great deal of concern over the fact that I had all of this background, a diplomatic father, I had my degree in honors from Harvard, and they were worried about having to reject me. So therefore I came to SICE, and that's how I came to be a student at the School of Advanced International Studies. Wow, fascinating. And tell us, what, what are some memories you have of being a student here at SICE? Well, first and foremost, I was quite aware of the fact that I was a black student in the first one there. Largely because uh, at the beginning, when I would go into the dining room and sit down to eat, there were sometimes that certain, certain of the students would get up and leave. They would not stay with me. Uh, in addition, however, I had a group of classmates who were very supportive of me. In fact, because of the fact that in those days uh, they did not serve meals on the weekends, we had to eat out. And they discovered that there were certain restaurants which would not let me go in there to have be a meal. And so they boycotted the class. Those members of my class boycotted those restaurants to, because they were objecting to my presence. Mm -hmm. uh, in addition, uh, I regret to say that the then dean, the founding dean of the school, had a program where he regularly every week would invite a certain number of the uh, students to have lunch with him in the dining room. And the entire time I was there, he never invited me. So I was very conscious of the fact that I was a black in segregated Washington, D.C. The other aspect of this, which usually people like me to tell, is that in addition, um, I was also had been a founder of the U.S. National Student Association and had been one of the national secretaries of the Condon Convention. And the person who had been president at that time came from Texas. 
and he had just married and come to Washington as his honeymoon. And he and his wife called me. They were staying at the Willard Hotel. And they said, Cliff, come on down, we'll go out to dinner. And I forgot that I was in Washington, D.C., segregated. I went to the Willard Hotel, walked into the a huge, beautiful Hope area, went to the phone, called their room, and they weren't there. So I immediately sat down in the lobby. And this was a big no-no. And as the, uh, as, the, as the man from the desk rock around and came over to me, he began to ask me who I was, what was I doing there, etc. And just as he was about to throw me out of the hotel, my friends just came through the door. They saw what was happening. They grabbed me and took me out to go out to dinner. Now, the reason to tell the story is that if you fast forward many years later, I became the first black CEO of a major U.S. corporation, which was called TIA Craft, a pension fund for higher education. And one of the activities of that fund was making investments in real estate. And at my very first meeting of the Real Estate Committee, when I became chairman and CEO of this corporation, I looked at the list of things that were going to be approved. And guess what? On the list was the Willard Hotel, which had been closed for several years and now had received, wanted to receive funds so they could reopen. And I looked at it and I said to my new colleagues there at T.I. Craft, I said, you won't believe this. I said, but this hotel tried to throw me out when I was a young man studying at the School of Advanced National Studies. And, but of course, we, we made the loan, and it was something which stuck in my mind as something which shows what could happen over time. Mm -hmm. That's fascinating. Tell me a little bit about any professors you remember during your tenure. There were, some, there were wonderful professors. Uh, one of them was in law, <coughs> who later became dean, and then another was another lawyer, was, uh, was well, uh, Hiss, Donald, who was the brother of Algie Hiss, the famous person. Mm -hmm. I also had a wonderful professor in Latin American studies mm -hmm. named Simon Hansen. And Simon Hansen uh, was a fascinating professor whom I included in my autobiography in terms of the description of what he was like. But he was the person who uh, recommended that I go to visit the office of Nelson Rockefeller in New York as a possible place to get a job and a mm -hmm. position. And if you like, I can talk about that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, but yeah go ahead. It was a case of where, uh, during the closeout, uh, when you're beginning to complete your degree here at mm -hmm. that time, the school always had recruiters that would come. And these recruiters would come and interview you. And of course, I proceeded to have interviews. <clears throat> and. Um, on several occasions, I would go in, and uh, I would remember one one occasion. Uh, it was a for a job in Latin America, and uh, as soon as the man saw me walk in, he just froze. And uh, when I began to talk to him, he said, "No," he said, "You you would not be suitable for our." Tour. I said, "But Latin America," he said, "Yes." I said, "But I'm bilingual because, of course, I had learned Spanish as a child." But he wouldn't answer. The same thing happened with another person who interviewed me from uh, the oil company Esso, and he reacted, again, similarly, was negative. Now, again, fast forward. Many years later, a good friend of mine was the chairman and CEO of Esso, and he wanted me to become a board member of the company. And I said, well, I can't do that because I'm also on the board of the Ford Motor Company, and it's a violation to be on the board of an automobile country company and also of a for a automobile and the oil company. And so when I told him that, I laughingly told him, that you would be surprised that you were, one of your recruiters refused to hire me, he was aghast. I mean, it was just one of those. But that shows, again, progress and change in time. Right. Tell us, and um, you have a wonderful, illustrious career, but when you graduated from SICE in 1948, tell us how it started. Tell us all about it. Well, the, as I mentioned, uh, Simon Hansen uh, recommended me for, uh, to go and visit. He had previously worked for Nelson Rockefeller here in Washington. And he thought that this was an opportunity for me to get a job. What fascinated me was 
that by that time I had decided that I did not want to go into the foreign service for a variety of reasons. One of them was that whenever my father came back on leave, he would take me down to the State Department to meet his friends. And they would all say, since I'm junior, they would all say, well, you're Cliff's son, well, when are you coming in? And I decided that I would never know if I was successful, whether it was because of me or because I was his son. And as a young person, at the age of 20, uh, you can understand my, my being a little bit independent with regard to that. Nevertheless, I was intrigued by the fact that my commencement speaker at Harvard had been George Marshall, General Marshall, when he announced the Marshall Plan. And that was a first inkling that I had of the dimension of foreign policy, which is providing assistance. And out of that came the Point Four program, the technical assistance, and I was interested in this. And so Nelson Rockefeller had begun a program of assistance, nonprofit, along with two profit-making ones. And that's how I came to go to Nelson Rockefeller. When I was interviewed, uh, I was uh, interviewed by a person who was one of his co colleagues, and eventually I was hired by the d director of this new nonprofit organization, which was conducting technical assistance programs, both in Venezuela, Brazil, and Costa Rica. Hmm. And I worked for them for some five years. And now what year are we, when that was, was taking from place? 1948 to 1953. Okay. I also became successfully and happily married. Uh, we had our first son. And uh, at the tail end of the, in early 1953, um, I was concerned that I was doing very well, I was getting promoted, but I did, I did not have a set of what I thought were the necessary skills in the field of development. And one of my uh, superiors there at the organization, a dear friend, he said, you know, Cliff, he said, I think you should try to get your PhD. Well, I hadn't thought about doing that. And um, he said, well, he said, uh, here's a magazine, a new journal, which was called Economic Development and Cultural Change, which was being published by the University of Chicago. And he said, read, you know, read this and see what it's about. And then when I came back, he said, well, he said, you could go to Harvard, but you've had Harvard already. He said, another very good school in economics is Wisconsin. He said, but they're institutional economics. I didn't know what those were, terms meant. But he said, the best place to you to go is the University of Chicago, which is the most powerful, econ newly econometric statistical economics in the country. And I was thinking, he said, whoa, what's that all about? Well, but two or a few days later, he asked me to come into his office. And there was this great, big, tall gentleman. And it turned out that he was Theodore Schultz, the chairman of the Department of Economics, at the University of Chicago. And I had read one of his articles in that first journal. And I said, well, oh, Professor Schultz, I, said, I read one of your articles in the journal and I couldn't understand a word of it. He said, I've been told that before, go back and read it again. <laughs> and um, I did not know at the time that he was heading up a program to study, guess what, technical assistance in Latin America, which I've been working on for the last five years. Mm -hmm. So he hired me as his research assistant to enroll in the school, work on my PhD, and simultaneously work for him on this project. So for the next five years, when I was at Chicago, I worked on the project and also worked on my PhD. Mm -hmm. And now we're, did you receive it in 1958 or 9? 58. 58, okay. And, but then, at that, in, on the group of people who were on the team for this study was another gentleman whose name was Arthur Mosier, mm -hmm. who had been a, who had received his PhD from Chicago, in a, and he was an agriculturalist. And he had done a very unusual PhD dissertation. He had decided he had been a missionary uh, at an in agricultural institute in India, and for his PhD he decided that what he should do with his wife and children, child, one child at the time, he would go and rent a farm from an Indian farmer, live in his home, and run his farm the same as other Indian farmers, 
and then write about this as a PhD dissertation, which is what he did, based upon a lot of research. Um, he did that. And his mentor had been Theodore Schultz. And Schultz hired him to be on this project for uh, the technical assistance program in Latin America. We became good friends. Uh, and then when, he, when the project ended, he went to Cornell University as a professor. But then he was hired, Mosher was hired, by John D. Rockefeller III to head up a new nonprofit organization which John D. III had set up to work on agricultural development in Asia. And uh, he called up and said, Cliff, he says, I need you. <laughs> I said, but I haven't finished my PhD. And my wife and I, Dolores and I, talked about it. And um, we were very intrigued by this. I had no, I, my area was Latin America, not Asia. But I knew that Bozier was a very unusual man, was a wonderful person, and I could learn a great deal from him. So we picked up with our son, Clifton III, came back to New York, and he saw to it that I could finish my Ph.D. dissertation. And that's when we, he sent us out to Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. And he sent us out to be there for 10 years. And I was to be involved in developing the program uh, in Malaysia, Singapore, Thailand, Vietnam, and for the first two years in Indonesia as well. And the program involved uh, making grants to universities for research and to governments, to provide visiting professors to teach in the fields of economics, agriculture, extension, anthropology, and um, it was a fascinating organization. And Moshe built one of the most amazing uh, institutions imaginable in Southeast Asia. To the extent that um, during those years, uh, where all of those countries did not have a single PhD in agriculture, in economics, much less agricultural economics. And uh, you were starting from scratch, completely brand new. Uh, there, were, there were only two PhDs in economics in Singapore, none in Malaysia, one in Thailand, none in Vietnam, two in Indonesia. I mean, it's just, it just a virgin territory, and you started with that. And um, over the years, I would have to say that that organization provided opportunities for many of the people in Southeast Asia, these agricultural experts, to get their PhDs in the United States. And then they would come back and become leaders. A best example of what that means is that uh, when I became Deputy Secretary of State, the number two position here in Washington, in 93, my wife Dolores and I went out on a trip to Southeast Asia. And our first stop was at, in Thailand. And the ambassador to Thailand wanted to have a dinner for us the first day we got back. And cables were made to back and forth, in which I said, I don't do anything the first day, the first 24 hours. But oh, we've got to have something. Well, he finally persuaded me that he would have a very small dinner party. So Dolores and I went to this small dinner party at the ambassador's residence. In the group of ties that he had there, the president of the university, whom I had sent to the United States to get his doctorate, the deputy governor of Central Bank, whom I had sent to the United States, a major, major officer in the Ministry of Ag in Agriculture, whom I had given research grants to. And he was amazed. I said, but those are the people I had trained. So it was the same thing when, even before I got to Michigan State, we went out to Vietnam for President Johnson. And we went to Vietnam, and all the people I was dealing with, people I had made, grants to send to the states, etc. So it was a very important activity and one which made a huge difference in Southeast Asia. But that was my, what I, my experience with John D. Rockefeller III and the Agriculture Development Council. Mm -hmm. now, what, now, you were there for 10 years. For six. You were there for six. And then this, uh, Dr. Mosher, in his infinite wisdom, wanted me to come back because he had begun a program to provide funding for professors, young professors, who had no experience in doing research abroad mm -hmm. and couldn't get it. Because if you had, if you applied to a foundation for a research grant to go to study in Indonesia or Vietnam, 
how could you, they say, well, you have had that experience. So how do you get the experience? It's a catch-22. So he persuaded the Ford Foundation to make a major grant to John D. Rockefeller III's organization, the Agricultural Development Council, and, but it was going to be to create a program which would facilitate um, the development of young faculty in research capabilities abroad. And he wanted me to run the program. So, uh, Dolores and I talked about it. We were very happy in Malaysia. We, were, we had lived two years in Singapore and four years in Kuala Lumpur. And by this time we had a second son who was born in Singapore, Bruce. Uh, but Mojo was very persuasive. So we came back to the United States. And uh, <clears throat> part of the program was that I had to visit U.S. universities all over the country, engaging in seminars, research seminars, uh, where experienced researchers would meet with inexperienced researchers and they would discuss particular topics, research topics, etc. Uh, keep in mind that in the meantime, during the years that I was in, we were in Southeast Asia, I did a lot of, I taught 16 hours a week regularly. I also did research, which I published. I also made work in grants for the foundation, so I had a dual role. Mm -hmm. And my research, of course, on many topics, became well known in the United States. So when we went to the, when I went to the universities, I became acquainted with many of the leaders, department chairs, deans, and faculty in different universities around the United States. And the program was quite successful. Mm. And that's when things began to happen, where I began to get inquiries about, first it was to become department chairman of a university, and then I began to inquiries about becoming university president, which is something that Dolores and I had not considered. Um, and it's that so was exciting, a, yeah. And that was the big change. And um, up until that point, I would have to say that um, my being a, a black pioneer it was below the radar. Uh, but one of the major universities that expressed an interest in me was the University of Michigan. And Dolores and I visited the campus and some of the members of the research committee, etc. But I wasn't too sure that I was the right person for them, and I think they were right, the person they chose. But soon after that, uh, John Hanna, who was president of Michigan State, who had built, been their president for 28 years, and built what had been a small cow college into a major megaversity, uh, he left to become head of AID. And uh, so there was a search. And there, my name popped up in the search, and uh, the more that they began to talk to me about it, the more interested I was, because it had a base of activities with which I resonated. It, was prob it had probably at that time the best and largest international development program of any university in the country. It had already started to engage in recruiting minority students. It had a commitment to provide education to a wide, diverse population. And it had a, a quality which is quite distinctive. Uh, which we came to really love. But keep in mind that all of these offers that I was getting was largely because I've been visiting the campuses and they all got to know me. Mm -hmm. the people at Michigan State, the huge number of them, they knew me very, very well. And then there was a big battle over them whether I could get elected. But that's another story. And this is now late 60s? 1969. 69. I was elected yep. in 1969 okay. and took over my presidency in 1970. Okay. Wow. Congratulations. And, and thereby, I became the first black head of a major research, major research university in the United States. Absolutely. So tell, us, time, tell us more. At that yeah. time, that was, that was above the screen. I mean, it was, mm. we had, uh, my picture was on the front page of the New York Times above mm. the fold. I mean, it was, it co press coverage, TV, it was just all over the country. You know. That's amazing. Now, it's 1969. Tell us what your experience was as president and how your career continued from there. Well, I would have to say, t tell, tell my colleagues and read my book because it's a very long, detailed book. Um, 
Well, let me put it this way. We arrived and we lived on, in the president's home on the campus. <clears throat> we were there six weeks and we had a riot, student riot. This is the period anti-war. Sure. Um, and um, it was a day in February, I remember it well, sleeting. The students had torn up the camp, the city, the village, well, that's video, East Lansing, up and down in the main drag. And the uh, head of campus security police came to our home on campus and he said, uh, President Warden, said, I think you should go out and talk to the students. It may not do any good, but I think you should talk to the students. And uh, I said, okay. So Dolores and I, with our older son who was visiting that weekend, um, went out with him. And he took us to the steps of the student union, which I had not been to before, which exactly was no more than 100 yards away from the president's home. And um, we got there, and uh, they gave me a bullhorn. And I didn't know how to work a bullhorn. <laughs> so here were the police showing me how to work a bullhorn. And they yelled the green crowd and so on. Um, our son Clifton, who was what that, he was about, what, 6'3", six, 6'4", six, at that time. Long hair, hippie tie, you know. Look, he'd been to the March on Washington. So he looked the thing. He was in the group with the students, you know, carrying on. And the police got him and brought him up on the steps with me, us, which he repeated later. Really, was quite an experience to go from being the chantee to the chanter, you know. Um, and um, I was—I uh, had never done this before, and I was uh, a bit too academic because I said, "Students of Michigan State, these activities are highly counterproductive." And uh, one student yelled out an expletive at me. And I suddenly said to myself, mm hmm, you know, this is, this is a new person. And um, when we got back to the house, the president's home, I could, see, I could see Dolores looking at me and saying, I knew exactly what he said, what is this we got into? But we then had, we had um, student demonstrations that, that year for a period of six to seven weeks. I averaged four hours sleep a night. My weight went great down. Uh, we had two, three, four thousand marchers tearing up the campus. Frequently, Dolores and I together would stand in front of the mobs, talk to them with no police protection. Hmm. It was a very interesting experience. Hmm. Right? But you have to go and read it in the book because it's got, I have a great deal of detail about right. what it was like to be a president during that period of time. Because no president had a manual. We didn't know what to do. But I brought the university through successfully uh, with minimal physical damage, yes, but no human damage at all. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's terrific. And I will absolutely look forward to reading yeah. about that in the book. So tell us, okay, so now we're in... 1970, 71, yeah, right, to 78. Then, uh, okay. and, interim, and during that interim, from time to time, I would get uh, inquiries about other presidencies. <clears throat> and um, and they, they were not ones that I would be interested in. Uh, I should explain that my first part of my tenure at Michigan State was in many ways difficult because I was elected by a vote of five to three. There were three Democrats on the board who wanted the former governor of Michigan, Sophie Williams, to be the president. And they could not get it done. And before I even arrived on campus, I met with them and they said, don't unpack, we're going to get rid of you by the end of the year. And as long as they were on that board, at every monthly board meeting, they did everything they could do to get rid of me. And I outlasted them. Okay, so. But it was a, a, a incredible experience. And... Um, my wife and I have always since then had a, a, a very special place in our hearts for Michigan State. We always have. And I can come back to that. But, but at this point, I was approached by the State University of New York, which is the largest university system in the country, 64 campuses, all over the state of New York. And um, 
they were in trouble. They wanted to make some major changes. Um, it so happened that the chairman of the search committee was a classmate of mine from Harvard, whom I did not know. And they asked me would I be interested. I said no. They said, well, you're not. I said, no. I said, well, if by the time, if you get to the short list and I'm on it, then I'll be glad to talk to you, which I did. And then they came and they saw what we had done, Dolores and I, on campus. They were very impressed and they offered me the job as Chancellor of SUNY. And I then proceeded to develop that institution, a series of institutions, tremendous long things which I won't go into, but I was able to, um, one of the ma I did major things in terms of um, elim eliminating over-regulation of the campuses, all sorts of things like that. But we were there for nine years. Uh, we, had, we had a wonderful time there, enjoyed ourselves immensely. And then um, along came uh, T.I. Kreff. And I had been a member of T.I. Kreff ever since I'd been with Don D. Rockefeller. So, mm -hmm. I said I knew about the organization, and in fact they had once asked me to go on their board, and I said no because I was overbooked with my corporate boards. I didn't go beyond a certain number, and then they came and they wanted to know if I would be willing to become chairman and CEO, the first person <laughs> elected outside of their normal ten, and uh, that was a very, I thought it was a great challenge, mm -hmm. and so in uh, 1987. I went to become chairman and CEO of T.I. Kreff. And there, um, I, can, I really revolutionized that place in less than two years, and doubled the assets in six years. Mm. And it was, it was fun. That was a great, I mean, I knew what to do, because like my wife, both of us had been on corporate boards for a long time. We knew what it took them to run all corporations. And uh, I knew what it was like as the members of their organization because they all were predominantly faculty, so I know faculty, no institution. So it was a very mm -hmm. natural fit for me. So I became uh, chairman and CEO of T.I. Kraft. And then lastly, uh, when I was due to retire, they extended my time for another two years, two or three years. And then along came Bill Clinton. <laughs> and I had previously been invited and asked if I would be interested in cabinet positions by Jimmy Carter and Ronald Reagan. And I'd said no. And when uh, Bill Clinton asked me, I should have said no, but I said yes. <laughs> but that was in 1993. Okay. And, and tell us, what, what was your experience there beginning in 1993? Well, it was only in 1993. Oh, it was only in mm -hmm. that one year. Yeah. Okay. Well, I was uh, deputy chancellor. A deputy secretary. Um, it was a. Um, I, <clears throat> it was role here in the, Washington D.C. Yes. Yep. Oh yeah, oh yeah. The yep. role of the number two person is largely determined by the secretary. And in my case, from the very beginning, uh, Christopher asked me to do certain things because of my management background. He wanted me to reorganize the Department of State. He wanted me to help handle the reform and reorganization of the USAID because I knew development. He asked me to spell and handle the 150 account, which is the total budget for all international programs. And then pinch hit for him when he wasn't there in terms of swearing in people and so on. Mm -hmm. Which was fine because it was an area where I could be helpful. However, I was not included at all in any of the policy making. Even though I had a lot of experience in the foreign policy area and been on, I had chaired a number of U.S. government commissions dealing with a whole range of things, going ranging all the way from trade to agriculture. So it's not nothing new to me. But they didn't use me for foreign policy. So this, I did the jobs that were assigned to me, um, and then I would say um, the Christopher administration was having serious criticism, and uh, he was getting uh, more and more criticism of what they were or were not doing. But I met with Mr. Christopher every single day he was in the office. 
for at least 10, 15 minutes at the every end, of, end of every day to tell them what I was doing, find out if there was anything else he wanted me to do. Never once did he say one word to me about doing anything other than what I was doing. Until they started the leaks on the fact that, he, that somebody was unhappy with what I was doing. And they put on me, as the newspaper said, a role of a scapegoat for their failures, even though I had nothing to do with the policy. So, this led to a confrontation between me and him, and he offered me some other position. I said, no, I said, I'm gone. I said, I came to be helpful. I said, no. Now, this led to, I would have to say, probably one of the most incredible outpouring of negative reactions, because everybody who knew me, and all the people in the press knew me, and they knew this just wasn't true. So it was, it was not well done, and that's what happened. Mm -hmm. But that was it. Once that happened, now we're in 1994, how did the, 93. right, 93 into 94, how did the transition in your career happen, or was that? The real transition, I retired. That's when you retired? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, congratulations. Yeah. Did a few things in your, uh, in your career there. Congratulations. That's great. Now, uh, tell me in retirement, um, have you all traveled? Do you spend your time doing philanthropic? <laughs> Read the book. Yeah, really. Right. Right. My major activity really was the book. That's what you've been doing. Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. And congratulations. I should say on film that um, you've just published Privilege and Prejudice, and um, we're going to have you at an alumni breakfast on February 23rd of right. 2016. Yeah. So, but I should point out, one of, yeah. the, one of the things about the uh, book is this. Um, <clears throat> one of the reasons it took so long is, well, there's several. What is I have a, an absolutely huge archive. Um, the footprint of our summer home in Cooperstown, New York, is entirely my archives. Mm -hmm. It's about 750 cubic feet. Mm -hmm. And it's going to go to Michigan State University. Um, I have every letter that my mother and father ever wrote to me from the time I was born. Mm -hmm. I have, my wife jokes about the fact I have all my grades from the time I was taking correspondence courses through Boston Latin School, they're all there. They're and all A's? Everything. <laughs> and so um, that, to a certain extent, was valuable, but it was also time consuming. Because, second thing is, I wanted to be as accurate as I could. And I found that in writing, when I began to write it, that your memory is very fallible. And you do not remember things correctly. And in fact, if it's a story that you've told many mm -hmm. times, I guarantee you, you've changed it to make it more interesting, make yourself look good, etc. And when I would go to my archives to check, I would find that the facts were different. Mm -hmm. I would have to change what I'd written. Mm -hmm. So I would say, in terms of the book, I spent about one third of my time just fact checking every time I would write. Now, also, the book is only one half of the original manuscript. The original manuscript was 1,700 pages. The book is 700 pages, or 600 mm -hmm. pages. Mm -hmm. So I had to reduce the manuscript uh, because my publisher felt it would be too long, which I did. But all of that and the checking. Lastly, I, I wanted to be sure that the facts were correct. There are many incidents that I've experienced where only I have the facts, such as the NCAA football investigation in Michigan State, or the experience of the, at the Department of State. Um, people who have read those chapters, where I know that there have been controversial issues and fact questions, and I have the, I have the footnotes, I have the material, etc., to quote in the book, I have yet to have anybody challenge any of the things that I've said. Hmm. And the people who've been there, Everybody who's written to me has said, boy, you really told it, you really nailed it, what happened in these different situations. That's but terrific. it'd be yeah. very easy if I hadn't had all of that detail. And mm -hmm. most people say, why all the footnotes? Well, I want to be sure that anybody who wants a challenge that can go and find out where mm -hmm. it is. Or historically, if people want to mm -hmm. read through yeah. it, that's fascinating. Tell us, um, in your years of, of, your, of your career, having written this book, 
And now looking back at having been a student here at SAIS mm -hmm. in, the, in the late 40s, what advice might you have for a current student today? Yeah. <clears throat> I, don't, I don't think I have a, uh, any uh, kind of magic bullet. Um, the, the one thing I would say is that um, the, I have been surprised by the fact that so many times uh, different aspects of my both experience and learning process have proven to be valuable before I ever realized that it would be valuable. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe a subject that I took and then suddenly it became relevant. Or an experience that I had, it suddenly became relevant. And um, there's a lifetime learning process which I emphasize with a lot of young people. They mean, don't ever think that you, everything that you have learned is in value, is not valuable or may not be valuable. You don't know what's going to happen. Um, let me give you a couple of examples. Um, now, my skill in being bilingual, that was just, to me, was very natural. But there have been a number of occasions in my life where it was absolutely critical and valuable, whether it was being confronted by a group of Hispanic children, the students in Michigan State, who didn't know I spoke Spanish. With, brought their mother with them, and the mother was complaining in Spanish. I answered in Spanish. And they said, we didn't know you. It, it was an automatic. But that's a minor one. There are big ones that happen, too. Um, the fact that I was a, a founding officer of the National Student Association meant that I knew a lot about student politics. Mm -hmm. Guess what? When I'm ten, dealing with student riots, I knew exactly what they were going to do, what they were likely to do. Mm -hmm. Again, I had no anticipation but you don't know. Um, the experience that I had, for example, with um, Mosher in terms of how he built that organization and structure, tremendously valuable when I got into research. Y you can't predict, but you can absorb and learn it and put it into your memory bank for future because you don't know when you would like to need it. Mm -hmm. Sounds like two. Um you took a lot of advantage of serendipity. Like yeah. things happened that you weren't expecting. Exactly. Like the oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. president. You don't, you don't know. Job no, opening. No. No. Yep. I never, my wife would tell you, I have, I did, I, when I began my life and career, I never in many years expected to become a university president. Never. Or a corporate CEO. No. no. It, it never, it, no, it was not even dreamed of. It just, just didn't. I was, in, in my role with the Rockefeller family, I expected to become the next to succeed Mosher's head of that organization. Mm -hmm. I might have, at that time, after that, might have become head of the Rockefeller Foundation. And as you'll see in my book, I was offered the presidency of the Rockefeller Foundation, too, at a very crucial point, but I turned it down. But that would have been the maximum that I would have thought of. But it was not in my kin at all. Mm -hmm. But I started wanting to be a diplomat. Mm -hmm. So you can't, you can't predict exactly how things are going to work or turn out. But you've done a wonderful job in navigating all of it. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to say thank you so much for spending time with us today. And right. thanks for all you do to help SICE in the world. Well, and, um, it's a great school. And I must say I, uh, I had some wonderful time here. I really did. Great. Good. Well, I hope you have a wonderful day.